thank you. So, in my research, I'm interested in what buildings do to people. Or, as the introduction has just said, I'm looking at spatial configuration on the one hand and what organisations and people do in these spaces on the other hand. So a couple of years ago when I did my PhD, and you know, you're at this party and you meet a lot of people and they ask you, so what it is you do in your living? And I'm saying, well, I'm doing a PhD in architecture and I'm interested in office buildings. And I'm actually looking at how office buildings can help people achieve things or how office buildings can actually stand in people's ways. The most common answer I get is people saying, oh, come to my space because it's really crap. So that made me think, what is wrong with the buildings? And I want today to talk to you about design. So seemingly, if so many people say our buildings are so crap that you have to come and study it, um, what are these things that go wrong? And I've got a couple of examples for you here today. This is a picture of the British Library. It's a fantastic building, designed by Sir Collins and John Wilson, um, starting the design in 1962, and it was finally opened in 1997, so quite a journey. What you can see here is a series of specially designed furniture in front of the King's Library. It's the most popular spot in the British Library. These seats get taken up five minutes past nine as soon as the library opens, and people sit there all day working on their computers. So what happens to all the other people who come in and want to work on their computers? Well, this is what's happening. <laughs> they are taking work anywhere, just a little bit too literally, and just sit somewhere in the corner. What's the problem with this? Well, it's not very comfortable, it's not very sociable, because these are the really the hidden corridors in the depths of the British Library. And from the point of view of the British Library, this is a health and safety hazard, as you can imagine. Um, they would really love people to stop doing that, but they can't because their cleaners need the power socket. So this is a problem of usage, one that was not quite anticipated, and where the building doesn't quite accommodate what people want to do with it. Here's another example, and this is a UCL department, by the way. What you see here is this corridor, these offices where staff work. It's actually quite a nice corridor. There's pictures on the wall illustrating what staff do. There's two problems with this, actually. The corridor is very narrow. As soon as two people stop and have a conversation, they're actually standing in the way of other people. What's also happening is behind us, right as we stand there, there's a seminar room. So there's a trail of students going in and out. And staff actually get so disturbed that they close their doors. So obviously what you want to have, what you would like to happen in a university, staff-student interaction or staff interacting, it can't really take place here. So another problem of usage. And I've got another example, again a UCL department. Um, this is the coffee, central um, tea and coffee making facilities. So you've got this nice coffee machine, tea making facilities here. And there's also the photocopier, the pigeonholes. So it really is the place for people to meet. Right next to it is the PhD study area and its open plan. So the PhDs have put up this sign. Please keep your voice low and conversations brief. This is not what this space is about. It should be about exchanging ideas, having a chat over a cup of coffee. So again, usage, obviously, doesn't really happen as it should be. So what is wrong with design, or what are architects doing wrong? Why, are doing, why do they not get this right? Let me say that, as an architect myself, it's an incredibly complex task to design a building. It's also very difficult to anticipate usage. As you could see in the example of the British Library, Sir Collins and John Wilson could not, for the life of him, have imagined in the 60s when he started designing the building that people would go in with their laptops and use Wi-Fi. So it's quite difficult to anticipate what the users are going to do with the building. So one approach to solve this, and this is what I want to talk today, is so-called evidence-based design. So this is changing perspectives. So how can we do design differently? Well, first of all, evidence-based design is a practice that is relatively young, and evidence-based medicine some of you might have heard of. It is defined as the conscientious, judicious, and explicit use of current best evidence in making choices about the care of individual patients. So it is about individual patients, so it's tailored, but it's also about best evidence, so bring in research to really help the process. So what could this mean for design? 
Well, first and foremost, it means to engage the user, to really think about who are the people we're designing for, and to really have a conversation with them. What do they need? It also means to understand working cultures. So this is really important, to understand what are they doing, in what industry are people working, what is the building good for, why are we doing this for them? It also means to engage in pre- and post-studies, and this is an approach that can really help to understand how the design shifts behaviours of people. So you would do a study pre, before you do the design intervention. You really engage with the people, ask them, what is it that you need? Why do you want to be in this building? What are you doing in your everyday life? Then you come in, do a design intervention based on this evidence, and then in a post-study, you ask the same questions again, and you see what has changed through the effect of my design. So this is a really powerful way of doing this. It also means to define and measure the right variables in design as well as in outcome. It means to put the whole process on a scientific basis, and that means to establish what we call an etiology. So this is again from medicine. It means the workings and understanding the essence of how space can influence behaviours. So this is about evidence-based design. And I've brought you an example how this evidence-based design process can actually look and how these spaces can look that are designed based on this practice. So this is an example from um, an architectural practice called Space Lab. They're London-based, and they are working with this evidence-based design process. The client they were working for is an advertising agency, and this is how it looked previously. Um, they were actually remaining in this building, so the building stayed exactly the same. It was only a question of reorganising the interior spaces. You can see it's quite colourful. Um, you've got small open plan areas, you've got this corridor, lots of closed offices. Um, you can also see in their previous space, there's lots of people in a quite dense um, space, and there's lots of things going on, lots of materials as well. So then Space Lab engaged with these people, asked them, what is it that you need? How are you working? What are you doing in your everyday? And then they made a design. And let's have a look how it looks in the post study. One thing they did was to tear out a lot of the walls. So a lot of the partitions went down. And the amount of visibility in the building doubled. So a lot more people could see each other and could see what was going on. And for this advertising agency, this was actually quite important because they said what they wanted to achieve is to have more collaboration and more interaction among people. And their work processes in an advertising agency, I don't know if you've had the pleasure of being in an advertising agency, it's very dynamic, very fluid. People change, projects change. So the spaces had to be quite open to accommodate this. So this was um, what they did. They also introduced quite a lot of kind of other places, so places where people could take their work, so they didn't have to work all the time at their desk. So the amount of time people spent at their desk went down from 53% to 42%. So people were a lot more mobile in their working environment. As you can see, um, it's a very open space. People can have a chat, people can talk. Um, so the amount of interaction in that space went up to 38%. So at any point in time, 38% of people were talking, and which is quite amazing, and which means the ideas are exchanged very easily. And what you can also see is that quite a lot of people are on the move. The amount of movement almost tripled from the pre-space to the post-space. And remember, this was in the same building. So it's just by redesigning the interiors to really fit the organisation and what they wanted to achieve. So let me wrap this up and finish um, with a quote by the Dutch architect Hermann Herzberger, who said that architecture should be like clothing. It should not only suit you well, but also fit you properly. Thank you very much.